morning. This is an exciting day here. You know, I always worry ahead of time, and we have such an important event and such distinguished people here, uh, Danny Meyer, Zoe, Kevin, uh, Gerard, that the room wouldn't be full. So the last three or four weeks, I was like, okay, we gotta tell people, we gotta tell people, we gotta get the word out, whatever. Um, I think everybody did a really good job, and uh, <laughs> this is great. But when we have such meaningful people coming to campus, we really want to capitalize on that opportunity. So um, I think today is going to be a great program and, and very, very exciting. So as, as Dean Taylor said, um, I'm very involved with the school, very passionate about WashU and everything it represents. I graduated here myself in 1984 from Olin Business School. Uh, and currently on the Board of Trustees here and also on the uh, Business School Advisory Board. I, I strongly believe in these roles, uh, along with the faculty, administration, et cetera, it really is our job to educate. And I think in this world that we live in today, that's fairly complex. Um, but at the very least, we want to make sure that everyone who comes here uh, leaves with the tools to compete in this world and, and to succeed, quite frankly. Um, and that was part of the vision that you know my wife and I, Linda, had you know establishing and, and giving the lead gift to this uh, you know business of the arts minor. Uh, the whole thought process is taking creative students, and that could be fashion design, communication design, performing arts, painting, sculpting, architecture, uh, culinary arts, obviously, uh, and, and really giving them the basics. It's just five or six classes, giving them the basics in counting, tax, marketing, finance. So when they go out in the world and they say, hey, I have all this talent, but I want to commercialize it, hopefully that gives them a little bit of a leg up and, and once again, the tools to succeed. Uh, I'd like to believe, and maybe you guys can ask yourself later when you know, have the opportunity to talk to, uh, ask questions to Danny and Zoe and Gerard and Kevin, and hopefully they will say, hey, you know, this would have been great when I was in school, and you know, wouldn't it be great if I had a program like this? And okay, we figured it out, and we're extremely successful. But you know, it would have maybe given us a little bit of a leg up. So that's the whole thought process and design behind that. Um, you know, in this minor, it's really three things. One is the classroom. I mean, first and foremost, and some of that is more theoretical. Others practical. So I know the first course is being taught now in the fall of 2019 semester. Uh, the 16 students, and it's very exciting, and uh, you know, Glenn McDonald, Professor McDonald, who's leading that, is bringing in a lot of the local people from the art community, uh, et cetera. It's been really great. I had the opportunity three or four weeks ago to sit in on the class, and it was really exciting. And I'm, I uh, watched a, a young painter talk to the students, and, and literally they were all uh, captivated. They just were hanging on every word, how she got the courage to start and plans to start and, and all the success that she's having at a relatively young age. I mean, she only graduated maybe four years ago. So that's really exciting and I think a great learning experience. So first of all, the classroom. Second is experiential learning and, and, and globalization as well, international. And that's something that's really big in this program. I know um, Dean Taylor and I have talked about it a lot. Peter Baumgarten, who you'll meet after, is the head of our experiential learning center. Um, I think it's really important in this world, and that's a big part of this program, and, and one of the things that we're really trying to do, get the students to actually experience what it's like in, in, in the working environment while they're students and prepare them further, and with more of an international presence, uh, all the better. So, so with that, an important part of this business minor is the experiential learning, and, and one of the things we're doing as part of it to promote it is uh, at least in the first few years, we're going to offer a, an opportunity for students who, who sign up for the minor to, to travel abroad. And I think the first trip will be in the spring, and it'll be to the UK, um, and actually go there, meet people, see what it's like to work in other cultures, environments, and actually do projects for the companies, which would be beneficial, obviously. And really to kind of kick it off and try to get the momentum behind this program, the best part is it's free, okay? So as part of our support, we're gonna pay for it. So that's airfare, that's hotel, that's meals, that's everything. So really all you have to do is sign up and be available the dates of the trip and off you go. So we really wanna get a lot of momentum behind it, really passionately believing in the value that it will bring students as they go forward. 
the third thing which is really important is, is live events like this. I mean, this is fantastic. Um, all the friends of the school, alumni, uh, students, I, I can see in the audience, we actually have some students here. Um, which is pretty good on Thursday at 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, but I know 161 students signed up, and uh, it's, it's, it's really exciting. But really, the opportunity to listen carefully, listen to the questions, the interviews, listening to what these leading experts in, in the restaurant world um, say and, and, and learn from their experience, I really think like that's a really important part. So I've said enough. I'm going to introduce... Uh, the initial uh, speakers, uh, first off, uh, Danny Meyer, who's uh, founder and chief executive of Union Square Hospitality Group and the founder of Shake Shack. Uh, Union Square Hospitality Group comprises uh, some of New York's most beloved restaurants, such as Union Square Cafe, Gramercy Tavern, The Modern, and more. Uh, Danny, his restaurants, and his chefs have earned an unprecedented 28 James Beard Awards and Danny's recent personal accomplishments uh, include the Julia Charles Award in 2017 and the inclusion on the Times 100 Most Influential People in the World in 2015. Danny's first business book, Setting the Table, a New York Times bestseller, examines the power of hospitality in restaurants, business, and life. Danny's also an active national leader in the fight against hunger. He serves on the board of Share Our Strength and has long supported hunger relief initiatives, including City Harvest, and God's love we deliver. Let's give a warm welcome for Danny. And then Professor uh, Peter Baumgarten, who's the Professor of Practice, Strategy, and Organization here at Washington University. He also uh, receives his PhD from Washington University. And once again, as I mentioned before, in addition to his faculty role, he runs the University Center for Experiential Learning at Olin, so that encompasses undergraduate, graduate, executive MBAs. Uh, let's give a warm welcome to Peter. Okay, you didn't come here to see me, so I'm finished, and enjoy the presentation. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, nice to see a full room here today. Um, we are excited about this event, excited about this minor, and obviously very excited to be welcoming Danny to campus, welcoming him home in a lot of ways, back to St. Louis. Um, I was uh, joking with him before. I think it was a joke, but I was a little bit worried that this snow came from New York, but he apparently says it's heading his way, so our apologies in advance. When it comes to that. weather, St. Louis always sets the trends for us. Uh, <laughs> It was initially branded as a fireside chat, and if I knew it was going to be this cold, I would have actually set up a real fire here. So, um, We're going to be talking about business of food in a little bit and business of arts, but let's just start with the food question at the front end. Let's say if you are landing in a new city, a city that you haven't been or spent much time in, and you've got 24 hours, so a breakfast and a lunch and a dinner, and it's not in LA, it's not a city renowned for the food scene, um, and you're trying to pick where to eat. Where do you go? How do you make that decision? Well, I think you made a, a flawed, can I just say how great it is to be home to start with? <laughs> I just gotta say that. Uh, you're making a flawed assumption with your question that We're I would only, have, right that I would only have three meals. Um, <laughs> and uh, there are people in this audience who know that I'm telling the truth when I say that. <laughs> Uh, I, I would absolutely look to have at least six meals during that 24-hour period and probably a couple snacks in between. Mm. And not because, um, not, not because I'm that hungry, actually, but because I, I learn about people and where they live and who they are based on how they eat. And can't say why that is, but that's, that's how I'm wired. And, um, and I, would do, I would have done a fair amount of cross-referencing of either people I know in the industry uh, or friends or sometimes things that have been written. There's so much that you can see online. You can see photographs. You, can, you get a sense of what the local flavor is. And I'm always looking for what's truly local because that's how you know where you are. And I think that uh, there's so much that, uh, that lacks that local flavor. That's not what I'm interested in. So mm. I would do that with any city. Mm. And, okay. it's, and it's great. And you get, and then each time you go to one of the places, it's a great opportunity to meet whoever owns it and ask them where do they suggest. And then that's why 
six places can become eight places over the course of one day. Mm. Fantastic. So a bit ago, you were on a podcast with The Economist. I was actually listening to it on my run this morning. Um, and one of the things you mentioned was a favorite restaurant in New York that just recently shut down. And you said something about, it was Barbuto, I believe, that they don't ask anything of you. In other words, you come into the space and it doesn't have to be a special occasion. It doesn't have to be a, a place where you dress up. What is it about that feel of a restaurant that especially resonates with you? Well, it always has, and I, I think when I think about all of my, the restaurants that I like to go back to, not just for the experience of trying a place once, but the places you go back to, I think are, uh, they occupy a special place. It's kind of like if you think about the songs on your, um, your device, we all have some kind of collection of songs, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a bunch of songs that you didn't like, but of the thousand songs you may have, there's probably 10 or 15 that every time you hear them, you just feel better and you feel grateful that that song was written. And when you find a restaurant like that, that, uh, and the way I did put it was that doesn't ask anything of you. It almost just feels like your favorite sweater. You just put it on and it may not be the best sweater in the world, but it makes you feel good. And, and why is that? Well, for me, it, it tends to be places that are confident in who they are, but not insouciant to the point that they don't care about me being happy. They just, they care so much about me being happy, they just let me be me. Um, they're not adding a lot of extra stuff that doesn't need to be there. There's a, um, a marketing guru that, that I love. I, I read something that he writes almost every day of my life, whose name is Seth Godin. He's become a friend over time. Um, and he coined, a, he didn't make up the word, but he he used the word in a blog to describe our restaurants, probably the, the best compliment I think we've ever received. And it's an Italian word, sprezzatura. Mm. And it was, a, it was a word that was used uh, to describe a form of art maybe 500 years ago in Italy, where the effort to make this painting wasn't evident. The painting itself looked a lot easier than it actually had been to create. And the opposite of sprezzatura in life or in business or in art, which is it's what we're here to talk about, mm -hmm. is the uh, tennis player that grunts while they're trying to hit a drop shot as opposed to Roger Federer, who's just like, just seems effortless up there. You know how much effort went into it. And I think when restaurants can convey that sense of uh, ease, it puts you at ease. As opposed to, I, I remember when we first opened our restaurant at the Museum of Modern Art in 2005, the Modern, and we had a lot of French people working for us. The chef was French, the service director was French, the sommelier was French. Nothing against France, because they've got great, easy sprezzatura bistros. But what these, I let this happen right under my own nose, and I, I don't like it at all. Um, the Servers, if, if you were a table of four, there would be two servers with silver platters, each one of which had two plates with a cloche on top of it. And they would stand at your table. A third person would come and one by one put the proper plate in front of the proper person. The two tray carriers would be dismissed to the kitchen. Another two people would come out and in unison, they would pull off all the cloches. <laughs> that is not sprezzatura. <laughs> and, and when you see the little beautiful tweezer created thing on your plate, you just wish you had a nice bowl of pasta and a trattoria, which is sprezzatura. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about, and how have you historically gone about creating that feeling in your restaurant? It's one thing to see it. So I can go to a restaurant and say, that feels like an old sweater. I'm gonna use this term from here and out now. In the, in your the favorite way. old sweater. My favorite old sweater. Not just an old sweater. My favorite old sweater. Yeah, the goal isn't the moth okay. holes yeah. and all that kind of <laughs> So when it comes to creating a restaurant that is one's favorite old sweater, in some ways you're having to do that at a little bit of a level of scale. So if I, for example, got to know you and found out exactly what type of sweaters, metaphorically, you like, I could start to craft it. But when you're now doing it for 50, 100, 150, 200 people a night, how do you drive that type of old sweateriness into practice in your restaurants? All right, well, since sweater is now the theme of the day, um, 
part of the reason that an old sweater is your favorite old sweater is because it fits you. And it takes the sweater and it takes you. And I, another metaphor that I like to use with our, with our team is a baseball glove. I remember growing up here, um, there was a sporting goods store called Geisler. There we go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to love going there, and I used to love smelling the brand new baseball gloves. Anyone remember that? That leather smell it was amazing. And invariably, I would ask my dad to buy me the most expensive one, because it was obviously going to be the best. And he never did that, but I would get like the, the third most expensive one. And I would take it home. Beautiful stitching. Everything was perfect. And then you tried to play catch with it, and it was terrible because it had not become my hand. And it wasn't a good glove until, yeah, I put the glove oleum and put it under my bed, wrapped in rubber bands and the baseball and all that, but it still didn't play well until I'd played catch with a lot of, a lot of people. And so what you learn is that a restaurant, a new, a new restaurant, an existing restaurant, doesn't get good till it gets broken in. And it doesn't get broken in without a bunch of things happening. First of all, the glove, had to be really good. It had to be good quality to start with. But that wasn't enough. What it really had to do was we have to have a dialogue with our guests. That's the game of catch. And a restaurant starts with a point of view. It starts with good quality with, with every aspect that you can think of. But it doesn't become that sweater, that glove, until we've had a, a long, ongoing dialogue with our guests. How do you scale that? You've got to get to know who your guests are. Um, and you've got to listen to what they want. And you've got to listen to, you, you don't give up your point of view. The restaurant can't just become everything to everybody or, it's, or it has nothing to say. But it does have to respond over time to how people want to use it. And the way you scale it, which is not easy, but it's, it's probably the most fun I have coming to work every day is to hire people whose greatest joy and pleasure is making other people feel better. Mm. And you know, that's on top of being a really good cook, or that's on top of being a really good sommelier, or on top of being a really good co-check, or whatever the thing you do, we've always said in our company, we only have two ingredients, which is great. 49 parts performance and 51 parts hospitality. So 49 parts of why you get hired is how good you are at the thing you do, and that we expect to get better all the time through practice. But then 51 parts, slightly more, is who you are while you're doing it. And, and the emotional skills that we hire for and we train people to hire for these emotional skills. We can't, we can't train the emotional skills themselves. But we can definitely train how to hire for them. What that means is, uh, and this goes, if you went to Shake Shack, and there's over 250 in the world right now, we're thinking about this at every Shake Shack, as well as every Gramercy Tavern, or Myelino, or Union Square Cafe, is we're hiring people who, while they're doing something a little bit better every day, are doing it primarily for the motivation of making themselves feel better by making someone else feel better. It's, mm. I mean, the best metaphor for that is a hug, right? If you want a hug, you gotta give one. Mm. You can't get one unless you give one. Mm. A hug in a good old sweater, in some ways. I mean, it doesn't get better. Yeah. <laughs> I should have worn a sweater if I had known this. <laughs> the theme. I the actually theme. brought one of my favorite old sweaters to St. Louis. Hmm. So you've talked about this idea on the importance of selecting effectively, and your team spends a lot of time picking people that can do this well. Now, we're in an educational institution. Uh, we are teachers, professors, students. And we think quite a bit about the idea of training, coaching, developing people that have these types of skills. If you were to be designing a university that you can't merely select on those criteria alone, right? It doesn't come out easily in an ACT score or an SAT score. What types of experiences or educational things would start to shape that type of entrepreneurship or hospitality that you're describing right there? So you're talking about uh, if I were the uh, director of admissions, or are you talking yeah, about say, hiring? Say, are you a, talking about hiring question. staff? Or so let's faculty? say you're the you're the director of admissions, and let's say you're a professor, and you're trying to shape in the students, the cohort of Washington University Olin Business School graduates. Well, first of all, I think from everything I've seen, and uh, 
Audrey and I have a son, Peyton, who's loving it here. You do it already, so I, I don't begin to think I have anything to add to that. But what, what I've heard from everybody and felt whenever I've come here is that I, th I think Washington University fires on all of those pistons because you gotta be really smart, but you also have to be a citizen and you have to be somebody who's gonna be additive to the community in which you're going to school. And I, I mean, I certainly remember from being in college or high school or wherever that who you go to school with is at least as important as what you're learning in terms of your development. And I think that um, I think that should be the purpose of essays. You know, when I saw a, a, a big trend in colleges because we have four kids and so we watched the application process uh, over the course of several years. When the Common App came out, that pretty much made, I, I think that promoted the importance of, of the scores you were talking about. Mm. Because schools, how do they possibly you can't just keep hiring more admissions uh, directors for the burgeoning number of applications, and so scores start to become relatively more important in that, in that scenario. And I think that um, the college I went to, Trinity College in Hartford, about uh, five years ago, um, eliminated, uh, excuse me, what they did was they made test scores optional but they reinstated the essay requirement. And what they were doing was exactly what we're talking about, which is saying that um, test scores predict how well you can do on tests, um, but they don't necessarily predict how successful you will be as a student or as a citizen or in, in business, in arts, or whatever field you go into. I, I don't think they do. Um, I'm proof of that. I, I, I was 0 for 3 getting into colleges. Um, and I had pretty bad test scores. Um, I did get on the wait list at one of those three, which I got off of happily, but uh, I, I just think that you just gotta understand that you're looking for the whole person. And if all I, you know, we have a jazz club called the Jazz Standard, and if all we did was bring in acts where you've got these virtuosos, we've all heard the, the tenor saxophone player who can bend the reed 25 different ways, the most impressive virtuosity you've ever seen, and you look at the floor and nobody's tapping their feet because it's not making people happy. And I would much rather bring in a jazz band who is playing for your pleasure and playing for their own pleasure. The best jazz bands in the world, when, when they take a solo, are having fun with each other and they're, they're inspiring each other, but they're also always, the best ones, always have their eye on the ground and they're watching to see if they're making you happy. So I don't, I, don't, I don't know how to hire students and I don't know how to hire faculty, but I do know how to hire um, cooks and servers who, who come to work primarily because it makes them happier to make you happier. That's, that's great. Um, one of the things that where we even framed at the very front end of this conversation and has been in the branding, the marketing, is that the ideal chef or artist oftentimes has to be some sort of mix of artist and executive. So you see this a lot in the restaurant industry when someone's deeply passionate about food but maybe doesn't quite have the same level of precision around their costs or are deeply passionate about experimenting and trying new things, but then all of a sudden they're not able to deliver on a consistent basis. When you think of um, areas for development for the artists, and we can even talk about chefs in particular, how do they start to get that movement or that ability to move effectively from artist to executive without losing some of what made them the artists on the, on the front end? Well, we've certainly come a long way from the day where to be a successful chef, you had to be fat. I mean, <laughs> I used to hear that a lot when I got into the business, and it was crazy. Never trust a skinny chef, they would say. That's, that's, that doesn't make any sense. But I, I also think that, um, so I, in my career, I, I, um, I really thought when I transitioned from uh, being a poli-sci major and fascinated by current events and politics and history, um, I was either going to 
get a law degree or a journalism degree because that was the appropriate thing to do at that point. And it was literally on the eve of taking my LSATs that I kind of freaked out and I was lucky enough to be um, out to dinner with my aunt and uncle and grandmother and long story short, um, my uncle saw that I was not excited about taking the LSATs and um, if it hadn't been for that dinner that night, because uh, I, didn't, I didn't see what was right under my nose, he was the one who had to say, all I've ever heard you talk about your whole life is restaurants and, and, um, and food. And it still didn't dawn on me that that would be a legitimate, credible career to go into. But I took my LSAT, never applied, because I got a bad score. Um, <laughs> and I, I uh, was happy to go into this business. That said, it was a, I'll never forget the day that I told my parents that I had made this choice. And that wasn't something you were supposed to do back then. But it, was, it felt to me like a safer thing to tell them I was going to be a chef than to tell them I was going to be a restaurateur. So art versus business on that, on that sense. And I did go to Europe for a while, um, did some stages in Italy and in France um, to cook. And I came back and, uh, and pretty quickly decided that, that uh, I wanted to do the whole thing and not go deeper into the cooking part. Now, in those days, par apart from being skinny or fat, chefs were pretty much told to stay in the kitchen. And it was a very different era in the restaurant business. You had restaurateurs who were the business people and you had chefs in the kitchen. And that has completely changed right now. You, you, it's very, very rare, and I love it when I see it, but it's, it's, chefs have become brand names, and, and um, developers want brand name chefs, casinos want brand name chefs, hotels want brand name chefs, and so chefs have had to learn over time to be business people. Some have made the transition, some have not. What I've learned is that in the very, very early part of my career, let's say the first five to 10 years of it, um, it didn't matter. It didn't matter to me that, that our chef at Union Square Cafe didn't really care that much about the business. I was happy that he was in the green market all the time and knew all the farmers and, and it just didn't matter. And, and what I now realize is that that was completely unfair or infantilizing or whatever on my part and on our whole industry's part to keep the chef in the kitchen and irresponsible. And so now, um, not only do we require that the chef, it's, it's a really tough time to be a great chef because you've gotta be that, that artist, you've gotta have a sense and a taste and a point of view that differentiates your restaurant, but you also have to, you have to know what to do with a microphone in your hand because you're gonna get interviewed all the time. Or on your chest. Or on your Twitter or whatever. Yes, on your chest, on top of your favorite sweater. <laughs> Although, where would you put it? <laughs> okay. Um, but you also have to be a good business person. And, and that is an ongoing, you, you know, I was once told by someone that none of us can, can really feel bad if we don't have one or two amazing gifts. Like, you know, I don't know how people who are great dancers can dance, because I can't. I know that. Uh, but that doesn't mean I can't do a couple other things. So in one way, we can't expect chefs to be great, 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 great at every single thing. But we also can't hold them back from being great business people. And what we're seeing right now in, in this country, actually across the entire world, is that there are a small handful of chefs, I think, who have emerged as great business people and great artists at the same time. And what's hard about, what's I think a lot harder for a chef than it is for me, is that in my case, I can take one business philosophy and I can splay it over many, many different um, restaurants. And each one of those restaurants can have its own defined culinary point of view, and in many cases, its own chef at that restaurant. Now, if you're a chef who's trying to build a larger organization, you presumably are taking one business philosophy 
but you're also, you can't be 15 different chefs. So, you know, there are some great ones who, who do this very well. I think Daniel Boulou does it very, very well in New York. Um, Jean-Georges Von Gerichten has done it incredibly well. And yet, when I say and yet, this is in no way to demean these guys because I couldn't possibly do this. But Danielle is always going to be Danielle, and there's only so many different ways he can express himself culinarily, right? So it's, I feel like I have a slightly easier job than they have, because I don't, I don't have to be, a, I don't really have to be an artist. I can, I can collaborate with artists as a business person. So I want to go to that point around the importance of chef as a brand. It does feel like in the world of Chef's Table and other such programming and podcasts and the like, the chef has taken on a certain mentality and aura of its own. Um, if I remember right, um, I believe it was uh, a time that you were chatting with a NYU doctoral student. Is it Susan Segaldo? Is that right? Close enough. Close enough. We'll call her Susan. Uh, so you were chatting with Susan, and Susan was a, a doctoral student at the time and interested in understanding your business. And to some degree, one of her conclusions was you need to be able to leverage some of the brand of Danny Meyer, but you don't want it to be fully dependent on Danny Meyer either. Can't fully be you, because that's somewhat limiting as you think about the scale and sustainability of your business. When you're thinking back on what you learned from some of that interaction, some of those conversations around sustainability of your operation, what, what did you take away from that interaction? That well, that interaction was uh, soon after we had opened an Indian restaurant called Tabla. And Susan stopped, this was 1998, she stopped me on the uh, stairway up to the second floor with her husband and she said, you know, really happy to meet you. You're not going to believe this, but I want to do my dissertation on your restaurants. And at that point we had four restaurants, Union Square Cafe, Gramercy Tavern, 11 Madison Park, and Tabla. And I said, cool, what, what? and she said, um, and I want to embed myself in your organization because there's, I have to figure out why I feel different when I go to your places compared to other restaurants. And, and so she, she did that. She became a, um, she was like George Plimpton in Paper Tiger. She became a co-checker, a reservationist, a host on the front door. She never became a cook. Um, but she, she wanted to feel it and then she wanted to write about it. And she wrote her dissertation and then we hired her to be our first director of learning and culture um, at Union Square Hospitality Group. And what she really helped me to figure out was that language is the, um, the mortar between the bricks when you're trying to create culture. And that any culture in the world, whether it's a school or a family, um, a fraternity is there, there's a common language that everybody has. There's nicknames. There's there's and we don't realize it, but uh, tribal uh, culture is always connected by language. It's how we say things that become shortcuts for how we do things and how we're meant to behave within that culture. And she, what she did, which was really really helpful, was. Uh, she started pointing out all these things that, that I kept saying or that other people on our team kept saying that had become the language of our culture. And she said to me uh, something that was so helpful, which is that whatever you guys have done to this point has been largely intuitive. But if you start to codify the language you've been using, you can make what's been intuitive intentional. And once you have language, you can then scale it. That was a really powerful thing. And then what that led to uh, a few years after that, actually about seven years after that, was uh, my decision to write Setting the Table, which is basically just a big glossary of our language, with, as told with a lot of stories. And what's kind of neat about Setting the Table is that not one person after all these years, it was. I wrote it in um, 1996. I remember the Cardinals were in the National League Championship Series that year. <laughs> no, because my book tour prevented me from getting to Shea Stadium 
till the fourth inning of that great game where Adam Wainwright threw a pitch right by Bobby Mania. Was it Bobby Mania? Someone like that. No, someone else. Anyway. Beltron. Beltron, right. Another B. Um, I was there for that. But that was when the book came out. Sorry for my... <laughs> And in all those years, not one person has told me they learned anything new. What all they've ever said is, you gave me a way to name things that I was feeling anyway. And what that tells me is that uh, if we can hire people, I actually wrote it for a selfish purpose. Uh, Susan Salgado had been telling me for five years, you have to write a manual for our team on, she said all of our chefs write manuals, also known as recipes. <laughs> um, and all of our restaurants have manual, service manuals, like what do you do the second someone walks in? What do you do the second they're seated? How do you set the table? And she said, but you need to write a manual for how to make choices, which is very different than how to cook things. And I kept going, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. And finally, um, when when Harper Collins said, you need to do the same thing and we'll pay you for it, I said, huh, Susan, um, I'll write that. <laughs> but what's been great about it, even though I did it for us, is that it has provided a lot of different people with a way to name things and be intentional about how they uh, want people to feel while they're doing that thing they do. So one, one follow-up, just because I'm an organizational behavior guy, so I find this interesting. Um, how do you prevent that language from becoming static or stale, right? I think there's a lot of organizations that would have certain principles written on the wall and language codified along the way, and then you start to see behavior in the organization where it feels less fresh or people are just going through the motions. They know what to say, but they may not feel it in the same way. What are the practices as a leader that you do to make sure that that is an actual rich embodiment of the culture and not just slogans on the wall. Boy, you're good. Um, <laughs> the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, the definition of culture to start with. Mm -hmm. And I've always, I've always tried to define culture simply as the way we do things around here. And, and I would then, uh, I'd put a parenthesis after that. So the way we do things times here multiplied by the things, the behaviors that we reward minus uh, the behaviors we punish. And I think that over time, uh, people in the organization stand up and they, they see that. They see who's getting promoted and who's getting raises and they say, they also see who's getting exited and they draw conclusions from, from all of those things over time. Um, an even better description of culture, which I got, um, I was visiting uh, at UCLA, maybe you have one here, they have an Athletic Hall of Fame. I bet UCLA's won at least as many national championships as Washington University has in sports. Um, it's pretty close, I know. Pretty close. So we had a tour of this and the athletic director was like, I mean, you can't, you suffocate with all the banners that they have and trophies they have in this place. And somebody in the audience asked the, the athletic director, what's the secret to all this athletic dominance? And he said, culture. And then the person says, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, I don't really know how to describe culture, but it's kind of like a newborn baby. You better pay attention to it 24-7. You better feed it at least five times a day. And the minute it makes a mess, you better clean it up immediately. Mm -hmm. I think that that's even better than my definition of culture. Mm -hmm. um, but so, so how do you keep it fresh and how do, you, how do you keep that culture alive? Well, what I had one of my biggest learnings about four years ago. And the worst thing you could say to me, you know, over many years as we were growing uh, Union Square Hospitality Group was if, if someone who had been there you know, so Union Square Cafe just turned 34 last week. Gramercy Tavern just turned 25 years old this week. Mm. That means we have a lot of veterans who have seen a lot of this stuff over time. And people in general, as you know, tend to resist change. And it's not the same. I, I used to go to work for 10 years to one restaurant, Union Square Cafe. 
And then for the next five years, I was every day at Gramercy Tavern with an office in the basement. And the same people who saw me every day and who could come to me with their problems can't do it anymore. And so the worst thing you could say to me in terms of how it made me feel was, it doesn't feel the same way around here anymore. Or you've become very corporate. We've become corporate. Or the culture doesn't feel the way it once did. And that was really hard because you don't, I, I don't want to lose I don't want to lose the magic. And so this gets to your question because um, I could never answer the question, how are we going to grow without dampening our culture or without watering down our culture? And, and so when people would say, how are you going to keep up? How are you going to sustain the culture even with all this growth? And I would just feel bad. I didn't have an answer for it. And I did get some, some wonderful advice about five years ago from a woman who's an organizational development consultant who we've worked with over the years. And, um, and she said, you know, sometimes when you can't answer a question, it's not a mathematical question with an, with an answer, sometimes the question itself is flawed. And, and she said, you're making the assumption that, that you can or should maintain culture. And I said, yeah, I, I don't want to lose it. And she said, well, I've heard you, Danny, say that culture is like a shark. It has to keep moving forward or it dies. So shark isn't maintaining its position. It's moving ahead. And we were having this conversation at, um, at, our, at that point, it was a brand new restaurant of ours, Marta, which serves pizza. And she actually pointed to all the, the dough proofing. And she said, you think those yeast cultures want to be maintained? They want to grow. And, and she said, maybe instead of asking how can, how can we um, sustain our culture even with all this growth, maybe you should ask the question differently. How can we use our growth to advance our culture? And at that point, she, she said, I've, I've heard if culture is the way you do things around here, you obviously have to do things differently. And that was a moment where she said, the thing that must never change are your values. And so that inspired us to say, the culture must always change. But the values cannot change, and they're very different. So she inspired us to, um, to figure out what the v family values are for our organization. And um, I'll never forget, I was so proud because we made it inclusive. We, we interviewed a ton of people on our team. And we came up with about 25 words that rose to the top of the things that mattered, inclusive, family, excellence, hospitality, flavor, you know, whatever the top 25 words. And then some really bright person on our marketing team said, I'm going to create a Wordle. I've never heard of that before. <laughs> you probably know what a Wordle is. And they take the 25 words, and then in the, the order in which they've been named determines the font size, right? So the, the one name the most often is biggest. And, and this person on our marketing team made 100 coffee mugs with all of our family values. And I sent one to, to the consultant. And she called, I didn't get a thank you note. She called me on the phone. And she said, you're crazy if you think that's going to work. Because you can't possibly expect, at that point, we probably had 2,000 employees. Um, you can't expect 2,000 people to hold themselves accountable for 25 different values. And you'll never be able to do it. And she said, you need to narrow that 25 down to four. No more than four. And so then we, we did it. And we came back. And, and what, that, what that has done for us, and our four, because um, I know you're going to ask me. What are the four? Um, <laughs> but, and by the way, these, these are ours, but every family has different values. So ours are excellence, hospitality, entrepreneurial spirit, and integrity. And, what, and then we, we do get more words to define and flesh them out. But excellence, it, these are the four behaviors and values that we will hold everyone accountable for. And we're all different people, so it never gets stale. And human beings mess up more than any animal on Earth, so that never gets stale, holding people accountable, holding ourselves accountable. But what we mean by excellence is 
that it's it's a we're not interested in perfection, but it's a journey, and it's a journey that says, I'm going to honor the work I did yesterday. I made mistakes yesterday, but I'm going to honor that, and I'm going to figure out how to do it a little bit better today. And that means it should feel fun to come to work with a bunch of people who, you know, as flawed as we were yesterday, we gave it our best. Now let's figure out collectively how to do it better. That's fun. That's why the Nationals won the World Series last night. You could see that. They kept doing a little bit better every single day. Um, and then um, hospitality. And when I'm pursuing that excellence, I have to do it in a way that makes other people feel better. And then entrepreneurial spirit. By that, I don't mean that it's up to every single person on our team to create a new restaurant or come up with a whole new menu idea every day. But I do mean that it's not my job and my job alone to come up with fresh ways of approaching problem solving. Everyone in business, even an artist, is a problem solver. Artist starts with this, if you're a graphic artist, or a, any t you, you get a canvas, you got a problem to solve. What the hell am I gonna put on that canvas? Um, everyone in our organization is responsible for figuring out how to do things and solve problems in a smarter way than the rest of us had figured out. And then fourth, integrity. You have to um, make, we're, we're all faced with judgment calls all day long, and you have to have the judgment to do the right thing, even when no one's looking, and even when it may not be in your own self-interest, maybe especially when it's not in your own self-interest. And so now, those are the four things we hold each other accountable for. We actually uh, have and I learned this from a, a burger place in Alabama called Pals. Has anyone ever heard of Pals before? Really good organization. You should study them. They're way smarter than we are, I'll tell you that. And they, have, they gave us this idea, which we use. It's in our office. It's in every Shake Shack. It's in every one of our restaurants. And it's uh, a pad of paper. Um, sometimes they're stickies, sometimes and I'm sure there's a way to do this on your mobile device instead, but we call it CDR, caught doing right. And on the pad of paper down the left column, it's very small, is a list of our four family values. And the other part is the date and two lines. And whenever anyone on our team catches someone else on the team doing one of those values, in a way that is commendable, they just write Peter, um, and they circle the family value, and then they say that in two sentences or one sentence, the thing you did that really exemplified that family value, and that's posted on the board, and it reinforces it for every single person. And that may sound like kindergarten stuff, but guess what? We are still all kindergartners. Um, we still like the pat on the back when it comes to doing things right, and, and it, um, that has perpetuated it. And by the way, it's also a very simple way to have a, a performance review, because you can simply say, when you did this, which is what the camera saw, now it's not disputable, um, and then you can talk about how that related, that thing you did, either this way or that way related to one of the values that you signed up for when you took the job. Mm. Great. So let me give one more question to you, and then we'll have a few minutes for questions, hopefully from the audience. We'll obviously be able to come back to this conversation a bit later on with the panel of other chefs. Um, but you are not only a, an executive and an artist, you're married to an artist uh, who's here, I believe. <clears throat> and what I'm curious uh, for you is what you've learned from that relationship and how it starts to shape how you approach the art side of your own businesses? Well, everything I've learned, I've learned from my artist wife, Audrey. Um, am I good tonight? It usually will get me 24 hours. Um, actually, Audrey and I met working in the restaurant business in 1984, and um, I learned how to set a table from her to start with. Um, but I also think that I think uh, being real, and I think, you know, people who are artists are expressing what is real about them 
in different ways. Um, and I think of the biggest thing I've learned is the difference between acting and performing. And, um, and I'm not, in, and I've learned I'm not an actor because I can't, I can't be someone other than me. But I think I've, in, so, in learning that, I think I've learned better to be me and to just be authentic to what matters most to me because it, it is a very different thing. And I appreciate that, uh, that this school is helping to try to bridge art and business together. But I think what I've gotten most from Audrey is that understanding that they're very different things. I don't consider myself an artist. I have a point of view and I, I care about expressing what I love about food, what I love about what you put on the plate, what you put in the glass. It matters. And to this day, you know, I'm the guy hiring our chefs and I work with our chefs and I care about how the menu wording goes. But that's not really being an artist. That's, that's caring. I think what artists do is that the product itself is almost indistinguishable from their heart. Um, and... Uh, and I think I've learned that. Great. Well, we have a few minutes before the break. I want to see if there is a question or two from the audience. Uh, we do have a number of people on simulcast, including my parents. So good to see you. <laughs> but as a result, we're, uh, Danny says hello. Um, we had asked that you actually go and visit the mic to do so. And we have a mic in the back right over there. And we probably have time for maybe two questions, and then we'll take a short break and come back with a, a set of people that have been living this reality inside St. Louis in particular. Hi, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm a second year MBA student, and I've been a big fan of yours for a long time. Uh, Blue Smoke actually catered my bot Vispa party. That's Not interesting. exactly kosher, but, uh... I, I, That's a new business line. <laughs> You had the uh, spare ribs? <laughs> yeah, and now I'm a vegetarian. Um, oh. <laughs> but not because Boy. of your ribs. <laughs> um, so I have a couple of questions. So my first one is, so Union Square is my first home. 10th um, University. Grew up going to like, you know, City Bakery, Green Market, Books of Wonder. Um, and the neighborhood has changed a lot. Um, if you go to Union Square now, it's like, DSW, Whole Foods, Chopped, Sweet Green. And you're about to get a Chick-fil-A there, too. Cool. Perfect. Um, <laughs> so um, my question around that is, like, as consumers start to value things like speed or health, maybe not with Chick-fil-A, but with Sweet Green, um, how can you continue to have an impact in the restaurant or food industry? Um, and my second question is more about food sustainability and accessibility. Um, so in the face of like climate change, how do you see meat alternatives and things like that uh, playing more of a role in your business? Well, thank you for your question. Um, you started off with neighborhoods that have not sustained themselves. And now I've, I feel like the question went to um, the sustainability of how we eat, what we eat, what the impact is of that. And I think restaurants um, are doing as much as any other industry in this country to shift that dialogue. Um, some restaurateurs have become activists. They go to Washington, D.C. They talk to um, legislators uh, for food policy. And um, even if you don't do that, I think what's on your menu is making a big statement. There's, there's absolutely no question about it. Um, I can tell you, we, in addition to the restaurants that we've started, we, have, we came to the realization a long time ago that we're not smart enough to have all the best ideas and there's not enough hours in the day to hire all the best leaders. So we've begun to invest in other people's businesses, other people's scalable businesses. And of the ones we've invested in are companies like Sweet Green and Tender Greens and Dig In, um, who are all really, really doing a lot to push the envelope on both health and sustainability. And we certainly, um, all of our restaurants, use the green market for the seven months that you can buy things that have just been picked you know, within the last 24 hours. Um, you did ask another question, which is, what's our, what would our position be on these um, plant-based meats, which you're starting to see all over the place? 
And so far, I'm not a fan, I've, I've got to say. I, I think that you can absolutely make the case that every time you convert somebody from eating something that took that much land and that much water to create that much protein, every time you can convert that into something that is a plant-based food that you've potentially done something good for the environment. But I don't think we fully know what it took to create that laboratory fake meat. And so our position, right now anyway, I think it's neat, it's, it's interesting watching it, but I would really, really like to focus, and, and this is where our investing is going, into businesses that are making vegetables more craveable and not trying to make something that tastes like something it isn't. It gets back to the whole sprezzatura thing. Um, so for example, it's, it's very, very tempting at Shake Shack to, to use Impossible Burger or Beyond Meat because it's, hey, it's happening at Burger King and look at their stock and it's happening at Wendy's and, and, um, and I, that's fine. But I, what I'd much rather do is to say, can we challenge ourselves to make vegetables themselves so yummy and amazing that are trying to be vegetables instead of trying to be a laboratory created version of something it's not uh, with things in it that you and I cannot even pronounce. That makes Salgado easy. Mm. Um, that's our point of view on it. And I think that our industry, you see this everywhere. Every single city today has uh, chefs and restaurateurs, um, coffee shops that are, that are really advancing this dialogue based on how they buy um, and I'll say one last thing. The, the, the conversation our industry has been having for the last 25 years about where it was grown, how it was raised, what it did to the earth, really, really important. But the thing our industry is now dealing with, in addition to that, which I think is at least as important, is how do we treat people? How do we treat the people who work in our businesses? Um, how are they paid? And I think that that is, the human part is at least as important as the animal and plant part of this equation. Okay. We've got time for maybe one more question, and then we'll take a break and be back with the regular scheduled programs in 15 minutes. Hello. Before a meal is served or the door is opened and you're at the concept stage of a restaurant, how do you find what will delight and inspire your consumer? And as your business has grown, what business fundamentals do you feel that you have added to find that next new restaurant? There's three ways that, that it has happened for me. And um, it's kind of neat. It's kind of neat the day a restaurant opens and you go, you know, Look what just happened here. There's going to be a place that is going to bring people together. And I think when, when it, that magic happens, and so I'm jumping ahead. I promise I'll get to the, the early stage. But I actually begin by, by envisioning the community I want it to be. Um, and I don't have any problem telling you that with Shake Shack, which started off uh, as an art project in Madison Square Park, where we were asked to do by an artist to do a hot dog cart that he was going to design to go along with four taxi cabs on stilts. And I was happy to do it. Um, we had some extra capacity in our private dining room kitchen at 11 Madison Park. And, and the, the two things I thought about there were hospitality. How can we take a hot dog and prove to the naysayers that hospitality is not just for fancy restaurants? but that remembering people, that's why we came up with a Chicago-style hot dog, eight toppings, and I wanted to train our team uh, to care deeply. Everybody, everybody in the world who gets a Chicago-style hot dog, of everybody in the world, 80% of them want it their way. <laughs> I hate mustard, I hate onions, I hate pickles, I hate celery salt, right? I hate neon relish. Everybody should hate neon relish. <laughs> There's no such natural color in the world. Um, but anyway, what, what, what I've learned over time is this, that hospitality and envisioning 
what that community, because that's, that's what restaurants do at their best. They bring people together, they give people a place, not just to avoid cooking and doing the dishes, but they give people a place to be with people. And so I always start with that in mind. Like, if this thing works, what will it look like? And, and then it's a beautiful thing when you open the doors and it actually works. Like, I'll never forget the day that Blue Smoke opened and I was up on the balcony and people just filled the restaurant. It was like pouring water into a glass and there it was. So it starts one of three ways for me every single time. It could be my first restaurant, Union Square Cafe, which I put every life experience I'd ever had into that one restaurant because I never expected there would be another one after that. And every restaurant I had loved, it was, it's almost like writing a piece of music where there's only eight notes in the octave and five black notes, so I guess that makes 13, I don't know. I'm not smart enough, that's the art thing. Um, there's, but no one invents more notes so how do you put those notes together is what makes a new song. And so Union Square Cafe was a mashup of every French bistro I had ever loved, every trattoria in Rome I had ever loved, every experience I had ever loved in San Francisco or Berkeley in a bar and grill cafe. And that became Union Square Cafe. And in that case, I had an idea. And now I needed to find the right chef and the right location for that idea. Then, oh, 10 years later, um, I finally let it go and open a second restaurant. That became Gramercy Tavern. Completely different prioritization of those three things. I had a chef knocking on my door saying, I really want to do a restaurant with you. That was a guy named Tom Colicchio, who later became top chef Tom Colicchio. <laughs> and in that case, there were, it started with the chef and now we needed to come up with the right idea and then the right location. So a different order of the whole thing. The idea had passion to it. The idea was, back in those days, Audrey and I were constantly going to antique shows through New England and bed and breakfasts. And um, I loved the idea of the American Tavern, but I also loved the idea of two-star Michelin restaurants in France and Italy where they weren't trying to be perfect, but they were really, really good. And I love the countryside feeling of that. And it was like, all right, what if Union Square Cafe and one of those Michelin restaurants had a baby? What would it look like? <laughs> and that became Gramercy Tavern. But it started with the chef. Then, all of a sudden, the next two restaurants were co-joined, uh, the same building. You had to do two restaurants because it was a landmark building. 11 Madison Park in Tabla. Now, I wanted to be on Madison Square Park. This building, 11 Madison, overlooking this park occurred and I said, cool, this time we're gonna start with the place. And now I gotta find the two right ideas and the two right chefs for that. So, it either starts with idea or chef or place. I will tell you this, as my uh, career has advanced over the years, it almost always today starts with the place first. And the place is like if someone gives you a frame and they say what art belongs in this, in this frame. That's how Shake Shack was born. Here's Madison Square Park, what are you gonna do with it? That's how the modern was born. Here's the Museum of Modern Art, what belongs there? Um, we have a new restaurant, we actually we just opened a second version of it called Daily Provisions started off as just a little box next door to Union Square Cafe. We had to figure out what to do with it. I didn't start off saying, I'm dying to do daily provisions. I said, look at that box, where is it? What does that neighborhood need? What does that neighborhood want? And you just answer that question. And that becomes, that becomes the answer. Um, probably one of my favorites, and some of them are really kind of strange right now, it, uh, we, we are happily seeing a greater interest in food everywhere all the time. We used to have something called captive audience dining. Museums, colleges, airports, ballparks, where you go there for the thing you went there for, school, art, 
baseball, you know, and you eat whatever they serve you because they got you. That's how it used to be, and that's why we all had overpriced warm beer, you know, uh, for all those years. Uh, but today, people expect to have good food everywhere they go all the time. And so one of the really, really fun things right now is taking some of those old captive audience experiences, like serving food on an airplane, which we do, um, or in an airport, or at a ballpark, at a racetrack, and taking experiences that we've always loved um, and bringing hospitality and taste to make that experience an even better one. Great. Well, there are three great things about events like this. One is the content you get from our guests. The second is the mingling that occurs between people talking about ideas and thinking about its implications for you. And the third is the food. So what we're going to do right now is take a 12-minute break, an opportunity for you to grab coffee and mingle a little bit, chat, and we're going to get mic'd up for our second Is that captive audience set. dining out there? It might be. <laughs> it might be. And we'll come back in here at 9.20 for the second session. Thank you.